Welcome. Thank you for watching this teaching video from Oak Tree Community Church in South Bend, Indiana. Please check out our other videos and don't forget to like and subscribe. Our mission is to help people come to know Jesus better and love Him more every day. We believe this will not only help our own spiritual growth, but also help us better influence the community and the world for Christ. For more information about Oak Tree, please visit us at oaktreechurch.com. There you'll find past message series, online giving options, and more information about our discipleship process that we call The Path. Now, enjoy this message. We'd love to hear from you in the comments or the website contact form. Thank you. All right, we are continuing our study through the book of Ephesians, and uh, uh, it's been, it's, for me, I guess, anyway, it's been really good so far. I hope uh, you found it uh, beneficial. I hope you've found some really neat stuff that maybe you've never seen before, some uh, important challenges, the principles that we've been uh, looking through. Uh, we've done chapters one and two, and uh, let's just, by quick reminder, Let's say that the book of Ephesians, this letter to the Ephesians, is about the body of Christ in practice. I've been saying this every week. It's not new unless this is your first time hearing it, and then it is new, and that's fine. That's why I say it every week. Ephesians is about the body of Christ, Christ in practice. And uh, we have seen that, and we'll in fact see it again today, that Paul did not know most of his readers Okay, even though we call it the book of, of Ephesians, and in some copies it actually says to the saints in Ephesus, that was not the only audience. This was meant to be like a, a, a widely circulated letter. So most of the people who read this, which by the way includes the past 1900 years and you and me, Paul didn't know. And yet there's really, really good stuff in here, as we'll see uh, continued today. And so he needed to explain to those people who had never heard him before, whom he had never met. So what is, what is the church? What is the body of Christ? What are we? You know, how does this thing even work? Um, how did we come into existence? And we've been seeing that over the last couple of weeks as far as those who were without everything and the Gentiles and the Jews who had all the promises and yet they were rebelling against God, somehow God has brought believers from both groups into a brand new system, a brand new, uh, he calls it a body, a new group, a new uh, man, a new person, whatever. The church is totally unique from anything else in human history. There's nothing that has ever been like it in the past, and nothing will ever be like it exactly in the future. The church itself will continue to exist in the future, okay, as the body of Christ, but there won't be anything once we are raptured, once Jesus comes to take us to be with him, there will not be anything like it in the future, okay, anything new like that. And then uh, what we are going to start seeing today Okay, he's going to just give us a little bit of an inkling today in it. And then once we get into chapter four, he really, the Apostle Paul will really start uh, doubling down on how are we to function. There's been a lot of doctrine. There's been a lot of theory so far. There's been a lot of foundational information about what are we, who we are, how do we come into existence. He's finally starting to shift into, all right, so what are we supposed to do? What's our purpose here? How are we supposed to function both on the physical level with each other and on the spiritual level? And this is really cool. You're going to see this today, as uh, Karen just read, on the spiritual level as well. Okay, so uh, our review, this is what we've done so far. Here are the first two chapters. Paul gave us a, the doctrine of salvation from God's perspective. We usually think about it from our perspective, but Paul said, let me tell you what God is actually did and how he views this. And he talked about some spiritual blessings that are guaranteed in Christ because they are locked up already in heaven for us waiting. And we've seen some of these sprinkled throughout uh, these first two chapters. I don't think we've seen the whole list. I don't think we know what all the spiritual blessings are that God has guaranteed for us. I think what we've seen in these first couple of chapters, and even what we see in the rest of the New Testament, is a subset of the full thing. 
I don't think God has let us in on everything, which is pretty cool because what he has let us in on is some pretty big stuff, right? Okay, so if that's just a subset, uh, which is what I think, then the whole thing, the whole package is pretty cool. The second half of chapter one, Paul prayed for his readers. This is what I'm praying for you. And he talked about how God has displayed his power through Jesus. And then all of chapter two, even though we broke it into two sections, uh, Paul talked about our sin problem, God's solution, and then he summarized it in the first 10 verses. And then he did the exact same thing in the uh, next uh, 12 verses, he just added information to it, right? So sin and salvation summarized there in chapter two. Now we come to chapter three. You're going to love this, okay? This is one of the reasons I like the Apostle Paul. Because in chapter three, in verses one through seven, he goes on a rabbit trail, okay? I know I've never done that, right? <laughs> I just get on soapboxes. He goes down rabbit trails, right? So he starts to say something in verse 1 and doesn't come back to it until uh, verse, we're going to say, uh, 7 here. Okay, 7 and 8. So let's scroll back here so we can get this. All right? So he's going to go down a rabbit trail, but it's going to have really good info in it. All right? And then he's going to get to his actual point, which also has really good info in it. All right? So I got really creative, and that's my outline for this week. <laughs> his rabbit trail and then his actual point, both of them have really good info. Because it's, it's almost, it's almost, and I hope you get this sense today, it's almost overwhelming. That's one of the reasons we uh, sang the song Indescribable this morning, because it fits so well with the passage. And what Paul has to say here is indescribable. Okay, he'll actually use a word unfathomable or incomprehensible because of what he is, is unloading on his readers who may have never heard this. Okay? And if you haven't gone through the book of Ephesians before or it's been a long time, it's possible that you have never heard this. So you get to be a first-time learner just like his original audience. So that's pretty cool, right? All right, so that's our outline. Here's what we're going to do. So what Paul does, verse 1, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed, now maybe your, my, my, my net translation doesn't, but uh, some, some English translations have uh, what's called an M dash or a long hyphen there, okay? Um, because he sort of trails off and gets this thought in his head. He's like, wait, Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. I need to explain what I'm talking about first. And he just sort of trails off for the next six verses. Okay? The whole thing. He does not actually get to his point until verses 7 and 8. Okay? So, he started to talk about his ministry, but he, this is the nice way to put it, he stepped back to confirm <laughs> that they knew what he was talking about. Okay? That's what we're seeing in these first couple of verses. Uh, if, verse 2, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Maybe you haven't heard this yet. Maybe I need to step back a little bit, lay this foundation so that you understand what I'm about ready to lay out for you. Notice a couple of things. First, he says in verse 1, uh, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Now, we've, I've mentioned, we've talked about this a couple of times now, where there seems to be, in some of this letter already, a distinction between us and you, where us is the, gen, or, uh, us is the Jewish people, right? They were described in, in chapter 1 as those who first believed in Jesus, first placed their hope in him. And then there's the you, there's the Gentiles, in chapter 2, as he's talking about bringing these two groups together, he said, you were, or let's see, Gentiles are over here, you were uh, without Christ, without the promises, without the covenants, without hope, and without God, right? And we had all that stuff. <laughs> okay, You were outside, we were inside, but Christ brought those together into one new group. So he's been showing this distinction in this us 
and you. And here he flat out says it. I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. I'm here because of you. Now that sounds bad. Okay? It's not meant to be bad, but it sounds bad. I'll get to that in just a second. Look at verse 2. If indeed you have heard. Well, if this was just to Ephesus they definitely would have heard, right? He was there for three years. He taught them everything he knew. If this was just Ephesus, they definitely would have heard. Here he's wondering, he's like, I'm not sure if you've heard this yet. So just a reminder that this was a lot broader, okay, than, uh, than just that one church. Now, he called himself a prisoner of, or I'm going to say for, it's not like, you know, Jesus was holding him captive or something, okay? He was a prisoner for Christ. Now, we know from Acts chapter 28 that Paul was accused, chapters 26 through 28, Paul was accused of a crime in Jerusalem. He, as a Roman citizen, he exercised his citizenship in the Roman Empire and appealed just like we have appellate courts and everything today, he appealed his case to Caesar. As a Roman citizen, he could say, I want Caesar to hear my case. Okay, that's, that's like being able to jump directly from a county courthouse straight to the Supreme Court. Okay, it doesn't happen in our system. But in Rome, you could do that. If you were a Roman citizen, you say, I don't want any of these lower peons hearing my case. I want to go directly to Caesar. And so they bundled him up, they packaged him up, there was nothing they could do, and they shipped him off, literally, across the Mediterranean Sea, and he got to Rome, and they had to keep him under uh, watch, but he was just accused, he hadn't been um, identified as a criminal yet, so they have him on house arrest as a Roman citizen. There's a soldier there with him at all times, there, you know, he's guarded, but Acts chapter 28 says that he had a lot of freedom. People came and went. He held group meetings, Bible studies in his, in his home there. He wrote letters. We know he wrote, at least from the ones that we have in the Bible, we have Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. All of them were written during this time, the best that we can tell. And I'm guessing he wrote a lot more. Okay, a lot more during that time because he was there for two years. Okay, some people may take two years to study through the book of Ephesians or Philippians or something. It certainly didn't take him that long to write it. <laughs> okay, so he wrote, we have four letters during this time. I think he was nonstop writing in between groups. Okay, people would come in, he would explain the Bible to them, small group study, the whole thing for two years. The reason it was two years is because, again, under Roman law, a Roman citizen could not be held more than two years without actually facing their accuser in court. And so the Jewish religious leaders who had accused him in Jerusalem and he appealed to Caesar and got shipped off to Rome, they're like, we know we don't have a case before Caesar. There's no way we're going to win this. So they never even showed up. But what they did was took him off the street for two years. See that? See, play in the system is not new, <laughs> right? You know the system, you play the system. They're like, there's no way we're going to win in court. It's not worth our time. It's not worth our money. It's not worth anything. But what we can do is we can keep him busy. We can keep him locked up for two years. Little did they know about his writing ministry. <laughs> and that flourished during this time, and God was still able to use him even when they thought he was off the street. Well, after two years, his attorney or whoever, you know, public defender, however it worked, showed up and said, your accusers never came, so you're, you're free. It's done. Case closed. And he got to leave. And there were a few years of ministry that we don't know really anything about, okay, because it's not recorded in the Bible. Uh, we have some speculation. We think, we know there's at least a one letter that he wrote during that time, which would be Second Timothy, before he was or that was at the end of his life, he was arrested again a few years later, and that time he was actually killed. He was beheaded by Rome, okay? A few years after, um, a few years after this, probably four years after this. 
all right? So what he said, all of that history, all that background, because while he was there under house arrest, and he's going to refer to his chains again in chapter 4, while he was there, he considered himself a prisoner for Christ or, or of Christ, depending on how you want to read it, but it is on behalf of the Gentiles. For the sake of the Gentiles, he's like, I'm here because of you. Not in a bad way, I'm here for you. Because I am so insistent that Jesus gave me this ministry to preach the gospel to Gentiles. That if I'm going to be arrested for that, that's for you. That's for you. Because I, if I weren't doing my job, I wouldn't be here. Okay? I'm here because I'm doing my job because I want to let you know this great stuff that Jesus has revealed to me. And if they won't let me come see you face to face, I'm writing it down. And we'll send it through the Roman postal system. Okay? He was that insistent on making sure that he fulfilled his ministry. And he'll tell us why in just a moment. Okay? Um, there is... There are all sorts of linguistic things and everything that we're not really going to get into because you might not care, but there's one that I thought was really interesting that you might like to see. In verse 2, he said, um, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. The stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Down here in verse 7, he talks about the gift of God's grace that was given to me, okay? And one of the things that we, we do when I teach languages, one of the things that we do is we look for repetitions like that that sort of act as bookends, okay? It's called an inclusio. It, it sort of acts as a bookend. He says something here. He sort of repeats it, maybe exactly, maybe not exactly, here, and that helps encapsulate this whole thought Sort of like uh, we would say he's circling back or he's, he's bringing it full circle to make sure that we have the, the full package, right? The, the picture. We do this in, in English in our, our, our literature all the time. He did the same thing. He called whatever it is that he's about ready to talk about, he called it a stewardship. The word is, is, is uh, um, where actually it's where, the, where we translate it into dispensation. Okay, it's the management. He was given management over some of God's grace. How cool is that? And then he said down in verse 7, it was actually a gift of God's grace that was given to him, that was granted to him, and he's going to explain what that was and why that's important. Okay, He understood that he was appointed for a specific purpose. You know, sometimes we miss that, don't we? Sometimes we forget that. The fact of the matter is, when we talk about spiritual gifts, he'll talk about it a little bit in chapter 4, we have the same thing. We're not apostles. We're not prophets. Whatever spiritual gift that God has given to you, for every person who knows Jesus as Savior, that is your story right there. Put your name in there instead of Paul. Daniel understood do I always put your name in there? Do you always remember that you were appointed for a specific purpose? And it's part of the management of God's grace, and it's a gift from God's grace. For us, it's not apostleship, it's not prophets, it's, it's uh, other kinds of serving and helping, maybe teaching, maybe other things. But the whole purpose is, if, you, if we go back, let's just scroll back very quickly, Chapter 2, from two weeks ago, verse 10, this is our, our um, we'll go all the way back to 8, this is our key verse, this is our theme for this whole year. We're talking about getting in shape, shape being the acronym for our service, getting in shape in 2024, because by grace you are saved through faith. And this package is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, it's not from works so that no one can boast, because... For we are his creative work, 
his workmanship, his craftsmanship, his creation, whatever your translation wants to say there. We were created by him in Christ Jesus to do good works. We're not here just to flop around. We're not here just to survive life. We're not here just to exist. We're not here even just to have a good time. We are here to do good works. We were created in Christ Jesus, for Christ Jesus, for these good works that God prepared beforehand so that we can do them. And and, and if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, he didn't just prepare them, he pre-prepared them, right? He got them all set up, got them all set up. So when Paul says, this was a stewardship of God's grace that was given to me, this was a gift of God's grace that was given to me, that's actually your story too. And that's why we're, we're so insistent. And I, I recommend that you memorize at least verse 10, if not verses 8, 9, and 10 this year as you, as you think about that, as you walk through that, okay? So, here's... Basically, what he's going to he's going to tell them what that was that by revelation and that means direct message from God. Okay, Paul was clear in Galatians chapter one and two. I did not receive my message from people. I did not receive my message from people. I got it from Jesus Himself. Okay, and so when he says something like this, that by revelation. The mystery was made known to me. He's saying the same thing. Listen, I didn't go to Jerusalem and get this. Jesus told me this directly. And it was a mystery. Now, mystery, uh, when it's used in the New Testament, I love mysteries. Okay, I love mysteries. Uh, You know, Sherlock Holmes and that sort of thing. I love mysteries. But that's not exactly what he's talking about here. Okay, he's not saying, I have all the information. You have to figure it out. Ha, let me drop some clues in this letter for you. That's not what he's talking about. A mystery is something that was previously hidden, but now it's being revealed. It was a mystery in that nobody knew it. And now, at least someone, in Paul's case, at least he knows it and he's sharing it with people. Uh, We'll see down here in verse 9. Let's just scroll to verse 9 a little bit. Uh, and to enlighten everyone about God's secret plan, the mystery that has been hidden for ages in God. Okay, he'll actually use the term hidden here uh, in just a few verses. That by revelation, the mystery was made known to me as I wrote before briefly. What? We don't have a first Ephesians. This isn't second Ephesians. <laughs> Right? Was this like a text, a short email or something? How? Where, where is this briefly? Where is this, this letter that he wrote before briefly? Okay. Now, some people are going to, to uh, link it to chapters 1 and 2. Some people say, well, it's not a whole separate letter. It wasn't something like before, uh, you know, earlier. It was just like in this letter, he sort of hinted at it. It's possible, but I like to think that if it was... Well, I like to think it was a whole other letter that we don't get to see. And this is all we know about it, okay? As I wrote before briefly, this mystery was made known to me as I wrote before briefly. When reading this, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Now, we have this phrase, the mystery of Christ. There are a couple of things we know about it, Okay. And we'll, as, as he's explaining this, number one, whatever the mystery of Christ is, we can understand it by reading. It doesn't take special education. You don't have to go to seminary. It, you don't even have to just, you know, have it here, okay? You, I, you, you don't require me. It doesn't require teachers. It doesn't require preachers. It doesn't require apostles. All we have is Paul said, you can read it and understand it. Isn't that great? Okay, sometimes you think, "Ah, I can't understand all this stuff. This one you can. This one you can, Paul said so. Okay, once he wrote it down, it was understandable. Number two, he said, verse five, which was not 
disclosed or revealed to people in former generations. Oh. So again, it was hidden. God knew about it. He just didn't share. Okay, It wasn't time to share. It was not revealed to people uh, it literally says in uh, in different generations, to the sons of people, the sons of men in different generations. To this time, Paul says, nobody knew about this. Which means by these two things, it's understandable by reading about it and it was not revealed to, to previous generations. That means, okay, I'm gonna make an extrapolation here. I'm gonna take a, a logical leap. If it was written down before, then somebody should have been able to understand it and then it would have been disclosed, right? Right? If it was written down, which means it was not written down before. And he's going to be talking about the church, which means, here it is, all these times that I say the people in the Old Testament didn't know anything about the church. You'll never find anything about the church in the Old Testament. It is strictly a New Testament thing. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there is very, very little information about the church. It doesn't start until Acts 2. There are a lot of people who say, well, there's all sorts of stuff about the church in the Old Testament if you just read it the right way. Paul is saying they did read it the right way, and it wasn't there because it hadn't been disclosed to any previous generations, and if it were written down, they should have been able to understand it. Okay? All right, that's my logical leap. That's my logical conclusion. There is no church anywhere in the Old Testament. The Old Testament has a ton of great doctrine. We sing so many songs with doctrine right out of the Old Testament. The Psalms and the prophets and all sorts of them. A lot of our songs come from the Old Testament because it's so rich with doctrine about God and us and sin and salvation and so many things. Not the church. It's not there. But now that it's been written down, we can understand it, okay? It was finally revealed, and he says now, and this word now means at the present time. A couple of different words for now in, the, in, in Koine Greek there, uh, in, in early Greek. Um, now means at the present time. As it has at the present time been revealed to his holy apostles, what's interesting is Paul did not claim to be the only one who knew this, and nobody else got to have the insight. There are people today who claim that. There are people today who say, we don't follow any of the other apostles. We follow only Paul. Paul is the apostle of the church. And they go off under some weird doctrine sometimes. Okay, Paul said it was revealed to the holy apostles. Was he one of the first to get it? He got it directly from Jesus? Well, there were other... The, the other apostles talked to Jesus before Paul did. Right? <laughs> and they got some revelation from Jesus before Paul did. Okay? So it was finally revealed at the present time to the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Namely, verse 6, here it comes, that through the gospel... Here's the mystery. Here is the thing that nobody could have guessed. Nobody could have even imagined that this was possible as they were living under the, the, the system of, of uh, the Mosaic law in Israel and everything. Through the gospel, the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise. In Christ Jesus. There's the mystery. Nobody could have guessed it. Nobody could have made it up. You can't write this stuff. Paul said, said that's how easy it is, right? Because when you write it, or when he wrote it down, it's like, oh, okay, I can understand that. It never was written down before. Nobody had ever heard of this before. This was brand new. Gentiles are fellow heirs. Remember in chapter two, we used to be without. But now we can be with fellow members of the body. Israel, the Jewish people, thought that when Messiah come, came, he would be Messiah for the Jews, Messiah for the Jews, right? Paul said, oh yeah, the Gentiles are included too in this new thing. What? 
He's our Messiah. We never would have guessed that. <laughs> we certainly wouldn't have written that. But now that I wrote it down, you can read it and understand it. Yes. <laughs> fellow heirs of the promises, fellow members of this brand new body that he just wrote about in chapter 2, a few verses ago, and fellow participants in the promise of Christ. This was unheard of. You talk about scandalous. This would have rocked the synagogue world. What is this guy talking about? The Gentiles get to be a part of the promises that God gave to us? Yeah. So what do they have to do? Do they have to uh, follow the law? Nope. Be circumcised? Nope. At least you got to come to our synagogue, right? Sing our songs? Re nope. Small group? Nope. Donate big money to our church? Nope. So what do these guys have to do to be in? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's it. That's it. Theologically, this rocked their world. It was scandalous. They never had heard this before. And it, 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 it undid everything that they thought they knew and they thought they believed. And this is why Paul said, I'm in prison, but it's for you. And it's a good thing. Because I'm doing everything I can to make sure I get this word out because it is so, so awesome. You'll never guess. You'll never guess what I have to tell you. Right? That's what he's saying here. That's what he's saying. You see, there was a division between Jews and Gentiles that happened very early on. If you remember, uh, doing some history in the book of Acts today, if you remember all the way back to Acts chapter 6, we're talking... Uh, and I say very early on, we, this was still like within the first 15 to 20 years. Within the first 15 to 20 years, the Jews were still ostracizing Gentiles. Okay, Acts chapter 6, the apostles were so busy serving tables and doing all the, the, the ministry and counseling and serving and everything that they didn't have time to teach and pray. And so they looked at the congregation, which could have been uh, probably 60,000 people at that time, okay? And so I don't think they had a business meeting, you know, just like, okay, we're going to do secret ballot. No, <laughs> 60,000 ballots, you know. All right, we got to count hands, you know. It's, oh, it's like 30,001 to 29,999, you know. That would have taken forever. They probably had representative groups or something, heads of families. And they said, this is too much. We can't do this anymore. We've got other priorities. Not that this stuff is bad, but we have other priorities that we have to spend our time on as the apostles. And so we want you to nominate people that we can put in charge of this task. Because what was happening is that when the widows came to receive their distribution from the church, their benevolence, their food and money and stuff, the native Jewish uh, widows seemed to be taken care of better than the Greek-speaking ones. And all of a sudden, there was, rah, 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 rah. You know, my mom didn't get her, and my aunt, and my grandma, and why did she get, and why is there this line, and whatever. Just very early on, there was already division in the church between Jews and Gentiles, and the apostles said, we can't have that. We cannot have that. It doesn't belong in the body of Christ. And we can't handle all of the stuff, so we need help to do it. That was Acts chapter 6. And even 15, 20 years later, by the time we get to chapter 15, they still didn't know how to handle the Jewish converts uh, 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 by the time we get to the Jerusalem council. Now, Peter, in chapter 10, was sent to Gentiles. Gentiles believed. They received the Holy Spirit. It was clear that Gentiles were saved. And by the very next chapter, chapter 11, 
Peter was actually like speaking on their behalf. Guys, listen, I was there. The Holy Spirit came. How do we deny them? We can't. If God has let them in, we can't keep them out. And yet they're still arguing and wrestling. How do we include? They're, they're not us. <laughs> they're not part of us. They're not one of us. How do we let them in? How does this work? They don't do this. They don't do that. They do these other things that we don't do. How is this ever going to work? Paul said, here's how it works. Focus on the gospel. Don't focus on the do's and don'ts. Don't focus on the differences. Don't focus on the we like and we don't like and my preference and your preference and all the other things. He said, it's through the gospel that these things happened. Fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow participants in the promise of Christ, partakers of the promise of Christ. It's through the gospel. And the gospel is the same whether it's Jews or Gentiles. And in Romans chapter one, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first. Even Jesus said salvation came through the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. Also to the Gentiles. It's through the gospel that this happens. So if we are focusing on the other stuff, we will absolutely have division absolutely have division, okay? In this room with people, a, a group of people this size, I don't even want to guess how many divisions we have when it comes to preferences and likes and dislikes and, and uh, some of our beliefs and convictions and all of the other things. There's lots of division in here. And if that's what we focused on, we would easily shatter this little group that we have, Okay? The reason we come together and the reason we can put all that stuff aside is because of the gospel. The same Jesus, the same God the Father, the same Holy Spirit for every single one of us, regardless of the other things. We can try to find commonality. We can try to find uh, uh, friendships. We can try to find other stuff on our uh, uh, the things that are not, we're not divided on, the things that we are unified on. But not everybody's going to like everybody. Not everybody's going to share the same preferences and everything. It's about, and some of you have heard me say this before, the gospel teaches us unity without uniformity. Unity without uniformity. And I'm going to prove that in just a second, okay? It's not, I'm not making it up. It's actually in the Bible. <laughs> not that phrase, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Okay, it's unity. The gospel was the solution, is still the solution. Verse six, through the gospel, the Gentiles, our fellow heirs, fellow members, and fellow partakers. Verse seven, I became a servant. I became a minister of this very gospel according to the gift of God's grace. It was given to me by the exercise of his power. That's, that's his rabbit trail. He hasn't even gotten to his main point yet. He had all this good stuff that he had to unload to make sure that they, we understood it before he could actually get to what he wanted to talk about. Okay? So when I said it's a rabbit trail with really good info, I'm not joking. <laughs> okay, this is the, this is the, now, when I say he gets to his actual point with more really good info, now you see what I'm talking about. There's some really good info in here, right? Okay. Verses eight through 13. What was his actual point then? Well, so if we go back to verse one, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, skip the next six verses to me, Here's where he actually picks up his point. To me, less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given. What grace is that? What is this gift? What is this stewardship, this management? To proclaim to the Gentiles. Again, remember, he's very focused. He knows what he's supposed to do. The unfathomable 
riches of Christ. Pick your word. Is it unfathomable? Is it indescribable? Is it incomprehensible? I don't care what word you choose. We've seen this now several times over these past couple of chapters. I mean, we're, we're almost halfway through the, the letter now. Okay, next week we'll finish chapter three. We'll be halfway done. Okay. How many times has Paul used big language to describe something? Right? Jesus is raised far above all the rulers and the authorities, the surpassing greatness of his glory, you know, that type. He keeps using this big flowery language. I think it's because of the same problem that we have. It's indescribable. So we're just going to throw as many adjectives at it as we can and hope that some of them stick. <laughs> Right? He says, listen, can you, imagine, can you imagine if you knew me before? He says, I'm the least of, the, less than the least of all the saints. I'm the, the, the least of, every, of everybody. If you knew me before, if you heard my story, I actually, my goal was to wipe out the church. I hunted Christians down. I imprisoned them. I executed them or had them executed. My goal was not just to persecute, to chase them, but my goal was to wipe out this church. And then Jesus got a hold of me. And I tell you what, based on my past life, and he brings this up a couple of times in some of his letters, based on my past life, I have no business doing what I'm doing. I have no business preaching the gospel. I have no business. I should be in prison, but not for that. <laughs> okay, I have no business doing that, doing any of this. God could have chosen so many other people to do this, and he appointed me. Maybe that's your story. Maybe that's your story. You think back to your past, and you're like, I have no business being here at all. I have no business being saved. I have no business. I should be long gone. But God, being rich in mercy, being the super overly generous, far above everything, gracious God. That's the only reason that we have anything to talk about. That's Paul's story. Might be your story. It's certainly all of our stories to one extent or another. He said, I'm, I'm the least of everybody, but to me, it's unbelievable this grace was given to proclaim to the Gentiles about the unfathomable, indescribable, incomprehensible, unbelievable riches of Christ. And here's the second part to enlighten people about God's secret plan. That mystery I was telling you about, I actually get to tell people about it. Can you believe that? God had it hidden for ages. He had kept it close to the chest, kept you know his card, you know, however you want to look at it. It was in a it was in a lockbox somewhere. He didn't let anybody peek at this thing. And now he lets me run around the planet and tell people about it. How cool is that? <laughs> can, 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 you, can you feel the emotion coming through what Paul is? I mean, it's, it's, this is why I think he's using all these big words and adjectives because he's speechless. He's just rambling at this point, okay? He just can't even get it out. That's how awesome this is to him. Can you believe what I get to do? <laughs> I get to preach the, the unfathomable riches of Christ that enlighten everyone about God's secret plan, that mystery that has been hidden for ages in God, who created everything. He created everything, and he kept this. There's other stuff he's kept secret. That's fine. We still don't know about it. But this one he revealed to the apostles, and Paul says, I get to enlighten people about it. And it's amazing. Now, verse 10, this is where we start to get to that third bullet point, how we function, how the church is supposed to function in this world physically and um, uh, supernaturally, spiritually. Look at verse 10. 
the purpose of this enlightenment, the, the reason that we are telling you this, the reason that I am sharing this, that I'm bringing this to light for you, is that through the church, and we're included in this, even 1,900 years later, the multifaceted wisdom of God should now be disclosed to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. Now think about that. Let me read it again, just real, real carefully. Through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God should now be disclosed to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. <clears throat> we talked about that. I'll skip that slide. Moving on. The purpose of Paul's commission was to reveal God's multifaceted wisdom. Remember that part where I said it's unity without uniformity? The goal of the church is not for us to all look and sound and act the same. Yes, we're supposed to become more like Jesus, okay? So there is a conformity there, but we're different. We're not a nation like Israel. We're not all one ethnicity, like Israel was, we're from all over the planet, every continent, every language, every nationality, every ethnicity, there has been Christ represented. We are a panoply, which is a cool Greek word, which means lots of stuff, okay? <laughs> all right, here's how I, there are two, two, and you can pick your favorite, okay? I'll let you pick your favorite. We're not going to take sides because that would be disunity, no votes, Okay? Unity without uniformity, so you are allowed to have your favorite. You can choose either the disco ball illustration or the prism illustration, okay? Here it is. We'll do the disco ball. The disco ball is out there. It's spinning, and you know the light show shines on, and it goes all over the place, the little mirrors, and if you put colored lights on it, then it's just like whoosh, very, very cool, okay? That is the concept of the, the word behind multifaceted. Okay, so many different little pieces and parts to it, like a disco ball. God shines his wisdom, shines his glory, shines his grace, shines his all, all, all the different ways that it's used, in this case, the wisdom, on that disco ball. And as it spins, and that's the church, his wisdom just shows in so many different ways. That's us. That's the church. The other idea is the prism. Okay, you're not a big disco fan, that's fine. We got a prism and the light comes through and what happens when the light hits the prism? Whoosh, breaks out into all the different colors. The ones we can see and the ones we can't, which is really cool, okay? Because we can't always see what's going on. Some of the spiritual gifts happen without anybody noticing, right? It's, we, we have a very small light spectrum that we can see, but there's a lot of light out there that we, it's, it's active, it's doing stuff, right? But we can't see it. So pick your disco ball, pick your prism, doesn't matter. Either one of them has the same concept. God shines through it and it goes boom, in this explosion of colored lights and, and flashes and all this different stuff. Now watch. So that through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God should now be disclosed to the angels, to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. These angels who stand before God, who see his beauty, who see the colors, who know him better than you and I do, God says, let me show you this. You haven't really picked up on how wise I am yet. This is the best plan of all time. I got to show you this, guys. And he calls the angels around. And he says, that's my church. That's my church. And they prove how wise I am. Now, if I'm an angel looking at the church, I'm like, I don't think that's, a, I know you, that's not really a good proof of how wise you are. <laughs> Sometimes that looks like a really, 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 let's say it nicely, unwise plan. 
And frankly, it looks pretty stupid sometimes to the angels, I would imagine, the way we mess around down here and we're supposed to be showing off God's wisdom and we're running around doing our own foolishness. But God said, listen, what I told Paul was that you are to show off my wisdom through the church to the angels because they don't get to be a part of it. Wow. That's a responsibility, isn't it? That's a, like a major, major either downer or encouragement, depending on which way you want to look at it, right? Let's finish this up. This was according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness. This word boldness means boldness to speak. Okay, it's not just confidence because he uses another word for confidence right there afterward. Boldness and confident access, but a boldness to speak to God, confident access to God by way of Christ's faithfulness. Now, uh, so he reiterated that God did this through Jesus. It still comes back to the gospel. Boldness means boldness to speak. Now, in uh, this translation that I have at the end of verse 12, it says, by the way, of Christ's faithfulness. Um, through Christ's faithfulness could mean through faith in him. The, the way the Greek language is structured, it literally could be through what Christ is doing or through our faith in him. It's probably both, okay? But depending on your translation, you're looking at that, you might be seeing that. It's like, well, that's not what mine says because the Greek text actually can read both ways, okay? And, and so, um, and we can talk about that more in second hour if you'd like. For this reason, here, he's gonna wrap it up now. So I'll wrap it up with a couple of principles to think through. He says, for this reason, based on everything that I've just laid out for you, the history and this great cool new stuff, I ask you not to lose heart. Don't be discouraged. I know, you know, I'm under house arrest. I know, you know, that I could be, you know, put to death, right? Don't be discouraged because of what I'm suffering for you, because it's your glory. Instead of being discouraged because of his imprisonment, use this as an encouragement to be bold in your own ministry, he said to them. And I think that that works for us as well. Use him as a model for boldness. And because of his suffering for them, and this is where, you know, I'm not going to scroll back up there, but he said, I'm a prisoner for you Gentiles. And now he ends the section. Remember that book ends. What I'm suffering for you. Because his suffering was for them so that they could get the, the gospel, there is a very real sense that it glorified them. Now he's not saying glorified them above God or anything. God is still getting the glory. But in a sense, because of what he is suffering, it lowers him and exalts them. Okay? That's what it means. by it, it, It's to your glory. It's exalting you. It's, it's showing how important you are that I'm willing to go through this so that you can get the gospel, so that you can get this information. Okay? So it's sort of like glorifying you. So don't be discouraged. Don't lose heart. Now next week... We'll finish chapter 3 with his prayer for them. This is one of the prayers, and I've said this before. If you've never read through Paul's prayers or studied through Paul's prayers, it's a really good exercise. It's really interesting. It might change the way you pray. Next, next week, as we finish chapter 3 and come to the, the end of this first half, we're going to go through his prayer. Before we do that, here are some principles as we wrap up this morning. Number one, there is no place for racism. Technically, there's only one human race. We're all of the same race, so racism doesn't even work. It's not even a good word. So I'm going to say ethnic prejudice, but racism is shorter. <laughs> and that's the word everybody uses, okay? There is no place for racism. Any kind of ethnic prejudice in the body of Christ, none. There's no place for it. The gospel is equally effective for all people regardless of ethnicity, okay? This is why the commission, part of the commission is to preach the gospel to all 
the nations. Make disciples of all the nations. It's the same gospel. doesn't matter what period in church history. It doesn't matter what language, what continent, what color, what anything. None of that matters. There's no place for racism, no place for ethnic prejudice. Number two, there's no place for racism, not just in the body of Christ, but in each individual Christian's heart. There's no place for racism in your heart. Because it's not just that the gospel is equally effective, but Jesus died for every person, and every person still carries God's image. Okay, we don't have to like everybody, but there is no place for racism or ethnic prejudice in the body of Christ, in a local congregation, or in each person's, each Christian's heart. It doesn't belong. Okay, number three, suffering. Suffering, especially when it's for our commission, for for ministry, should lead us to boldness and courage. We've got confident access to God. Last week I I showed you in Hebrews chapter uh, 4, we we are to come boldly to the throne of grace that we can ask help anytime we need it. It should create boldness in us, not make us cowardly. And number four, we should live in such a way. And I know it's the church at large, but the church is made up of people. And so it's for each one of us. We each should live in such a way that even the angels who stand in God's presence day in and day out are awed by his wisdom at work, at display on earth through the church. That's a pretty big responsibility. I hope it's encouraging, not discouraging, Okay, because he just said, don't be discouraged. So (laughs) I hope it's encouraging, but I hope it is challenging and maybe a little convicting as we work through Paul's letter together.